Hello everybody, my name is Kat Cosgrove and welcome to another episode of The Road to KubeCon. Uh, before we get going, I am forced to remind everyone that this is an official CNCF live stream and as such, all of us, including you, Twitch chat, are beholden to the CNCF code of conduct, which pretty much just boils down to be nice to each other and don't say anything that's going to make anybody else uncomfortable. Thank you because I can see the Twitch chat and I will ban you like super fast. So uh, please be chill. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kat Cosgrove. I am here with Ralph and Stu, and we are here to talk about WebAssembly, which includes uh, the Wasm Day co-located co event at KubeCon coming up in uh, four days. It's four days from now, right, Ralph? Wasm Day? Yes, Thursday. So four working days. Four working days until the co-located event. And we also have Stu with us to talk about uh, WebAssembly as an actual user. We brought a case study, isn't that fun? <laughs> uh, make sure that if you are not currently following the Twitch channel to please follow us on Twitch. There's a little like heart button you can just click. It doesn't cost you anything. Please do that because uh, we were given a goal for a certain number of followers to have by KubeCon and we're really, really close and it would be cool if we hit it. Thank you. Anyway, uh, Ralph, Stu, why don't you tell me who you are? Uh, I'm Ralph Scolacci. I'm a, officially a program manager at Azure Core Compute and on the upstream team, which is basically we do uh, the upstream work necessarily uh, necessary to support not only the uh, upstream stuff that we use in our services like Kubernetes and so forth, but also other developer and operational tooling. So I used to be the PM for Helm. If you're in Ooh. the Kubernetes space, I'm no longer. Bridget uh, Kramut does that. She's fantastic. Uh, but that's the realm I'm in and where I work. Um, hi, I'm uh, Stuart Harris or Stu, um, one of the founders of Red Badger, which is a consultancy um, in London, in the UK, um, we work with um, blue chips basically to help them with their digital product transformation. Um, so we have clients in the financial services industry, big banks like HSBC and Santander, in the retail industry like Nando's and Tesco, etc., um, and um, in in various other uh, other sectors sectors as well, um, and. We help our clients transform, basically. So we we do it by um, getting in there on the ground and building product, digital product, with them, um, and leaving a legacy and helping them helping them move product fast. Rad, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, can y'all tell me like what what WebAssembly is and why this is useful? Um, Stu, let me start because I'm I want to give the kind of the the high level version and then I'm really interested as a user and people yeah. uh, and somebody who works with people who are using this now I'd be interested in how you explain it because sure. the two may not be the same I mean WebAssembly is a, a specification in W3C for a stack based virtual machine uh, what does that kind of mean it's a basically it's a virtual machine so metaphorically you could think like a virtual machine but also things like JVMs and stuff like this uh, there's a sort of a a family of virtual machines uh, that you can think of that WebAssembly is part of. But what makes it different is because it's a W3C spec, um, it can be implemented in any number of languages. There are a wide array of runtimes available. So you can choose your type of runtime for your particular situation, for example. I'm, I'm curious about Stu's usage in, in his work. Um, but also uh, not just the runtimes, but the languages in which the modules are, uh, from which the modules compile can be uh, any number of things. So there's wide array of languages. Because that's the case and because the runtime and can be very small and the modules are binaries really, not environments like we think of containers as being a whole environment, right? Okay. Not just the program, but also the file system underneath and things like this. Um, they can be extremely small. In addition to be uh, architecture agnostic, operating system agnostic, things like that. So they have a lot more flexibility in the true cloud native sense. So if you think containers, 
They're binaries instead, and they run absolutely everywhere. Containers go a lot of places, but not absolutely everywhere. So that's how small a are high-level talking? way of looking at it. Huh? How small are we talking here? Like how, how well, tight? Well, you can get, I know there are run times down less than three megabytes, oh, wow. uh, and okay. your binaries can drop extremely small. Uh, to extremely small sizes. Mm. So for example, you can have fully functional services with a binary that's, you know, 100 KB to a megabyte, depending on what your workload is. Whereas the same <laughs> workload, when it brings the environment with it, right, which is typical yeah. in containers, you often will just X copy and use Scratch or something like right. this, but even so, it'll it'll be much larger than that. And that doesn't include the runtime. So you've got Docker, if you've got ContainerD or whatever it might be, those things are a little bit more substantial. And now, the only other thing that's important about WebAssembly is that it also has a, by default, deny security stance, which means that you can't actually move anything across the module sandbox boundary, the, the VM boundary, um, without it being considered untrusted. And so the host has complete control. That's only important because in the container world and in the in the Kubernetes world, mm -hmm. we go to a lot of effort in all distributions everywhere to sort of plug all the holes and make sure that it's denied by default except for that one bit of functionality. So it actually has the reverse security assumptions by default as containers do. Now that's the way I, I talk about it. Now I'm really interested in Stu's version. Yeah, Stu, you're a user. So how, how do you describe WebAssembly? I, I think that was a great description of it, Ralph. Well, brilliant. Um, the the virtual, the, you know, the stack-based virtual machine with linear memory that you talked about is a conceptual machine. It's not like it's just a standard, and and so anything can run in it. And the, the great thing about I think about WebAssembly is it's so unopinionated about the types of languages that can be compiled to it. Um, and to run in it. So it's not like the JVM, which, you know, make, you know, only certain types of languages will fit in there. And it's, you know, it's got, it's got a, um, a whole bunch of code to let you do things like mm -hmm. access the file system, for instance. WebAssembly doesn't, ha doesn't have that. So it's a conceptual machine and an architecture agnostic, like you, like you mentioned. So, I mean, even to the point of endian so, you know, whether, whether the host is big endian or little endian doesn't matter. So, that that's great because that means now that it, for almost I think possibly for the first time in history we have a universal target for any programming language that can run on any machine anywhere. So that's that portability is absolutely vital I think. And this with the security aspects that you mentioned, the deny by default. You know you you can't do anything. <laughs> Literally, you can't do anything unless you. <laughs> You, unless you've been given the code to do it and the and the permissions to do it, so with things like WebAssembly system interface, um, you can provide very granular control to the system call level or whatever um, about what the the um, guest code can actually do, and that's that, that's crucial with today's like supply chain, um, you know, the software supply chain, which I, I just can't get over, like. All of our clients, and you know, we've done it ourselves so many times. We we build an open source, uh, you know, build a, a, a microservice with mm -hmm. a ton of open source software. If we we're providing it in for Node.js, for instance, it might have so many um, Node modules, like thousands potentially, and yeah. you don't know what's hiding in there. Oh yeah, it can get nasty like really, really, really you fast. Really don't know what's hiding in there, and yet you know that's that's the price that we're will or today that we think we're willing to pay to be able to get that um, that capability. Um, whereas WebAssembly, like you know, if there is a rogue module in there, it can't call home with all your data um, unless you've specifically given it permission to do so. So that that security, the portability, um, is. Amazing. I mean, like literally anything from a Raspberry Pi or from a microcontroller, all you know, system on a chip or something, all the way up to any cloud provider, any any architecture, it's all good. And that's amazing. That's phenomenal, really. That is pretty rad. That it's it's that it's that versatile. Um, you have you. We brought you here because you're our case study. So you have you have actually. Uh, done things in the real world for a real large client using WebAssembly. 
Uh, what exactly did that achieve for you? I don't, I don't know how much you can talk about that without like getting into like an NDA issue. Sure. But, uh, so well, we, what did you actually achieve? How much can um, you tell us? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I can say that, um, you know, we worked with one of Europe's largest banks um, on um, helping them build a proof of concept and design a future state architecture for, for, platform for them to host applications that's multi-cloud um because you know the bank in one country will be on azure the bank the same bank sure. in another country will be on um, aws and then on another country they're on prem um and they they have this really heterogeneous environment um and if a microservice is running in azure over here and in aws over here like connect the con connectivity the firewall rules the you know you know how much work goes, you know, everybody in the organization basically gets involved in some capacity or other um, when you kind of join, trying to join all these things up together. Um, and so what they needed was um, something that effectively sits above all of those cloud providers or um, on-prem data centers that is a homogenous surface rather than all the heter heterogeneous different, you know, building, Kubernetes is the same everywhere, which is great. Right? I mean, yeah. that, that's that's amazing. But what's around the Kubernetes is very different in Azure or in AWS or GCP. Um, and so somehow we need to kind of abstract ourselves away above the cloud and almost use the use cloud, I think, as a as a utility. Um, and that's the holy grail that I'm looking for and and that um you know we were, we were helping um our clients get to so like like the, and and it's probably a year out but but there yeah. are work we've built working proof of concepts today um which are um well mind-blowing in my opinion that is re really i actually usually i have a, like a bit on this show where i like i pretend i don't know what a project is um but, but two days in a row, I've got a project that I actually don't know much about. Yesterday, I, I didn't actually know much about Prometheus. I don't have to work with it much. And uh, today, I, I know I came into this knowing very little about WebAssembly. So uh, this is fun and educational for me genuinely as well. Uh, it's not a bit today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, Ralph, does Stu's explanation of what WebAssembly is and how it's being used track with your expectations as uh, a maintainer? Yeah, uh, it does. But uh, of course, there's the, the devil's always in the details and sort of, you know, Stu sort of put his finger on it when he's talking about using cloud compute as a commodity for uh, customers and business. They actually don't want to care too much about where they run. They, you know, they want to make sure that the, the workload runs. And that's what we wanted out of Kubernetes. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, shared tools, open source standards and so forth, um, give engineers and businesses, communities, anybody, the ability to have this kind of power and build new things very, very rapidly and have confidence about uh, the entire environment in which they work and abstract away some of the important details that they nonetheless have to deal with. So yeah, it, that this is exactly the goal. It's, a, it's the goal of Kubernetes and, and containers as well. So the interesting thing is that uh, I often get asked like, what is WebAssembly versus containers kind of thing? And the answer is no, we're still running containers. Um, they're fantastic things. It's just this that WebAssembly like adversarial thing between web no, 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 no. Uh, the proper way to look at this is we are engineers, and so what we do is we try and find the right tool for the solution space. Sure. And Kubernetes is an absolutely brilliant, and KubeCon and and Docker, all of that stuff, we are well aware of it. And the, so the question is, what more? What else can we do with Kubernetes? What else can we do with open source? And why is cloud native more than just containers? But containers are the critical workload uh, you know, package, if you will. And WebAssembly is just a little bit of a step in these other areas that allows people to do a little bit more along with containers and Kubernetes. Absolutely. I, ju I just saw something in the chat about, yep. do we have a, a Kubernetes runtime to run WebAssembly yet? And and the answer is, um, we've got loads of them because um, there's, 
WebAssembly in the browser and there's WebAssembly server side. WebAssembly server side, had, because it's such a simple specification, I guess, in comparison to a lot of virtual machines, um, there's a whole host of runtimes and they can all run inside um, a container in a pod in Kubernetes um, quite happily. Um, and I think this, this, um, this better together kind of story of like, um, you know, Kubernetes as a, as a, as a base for running web, really lightweight web assembly, um, workloads is, is a killer combination. And there's, uh, if I'll, I'll throw in one other thing too, and there, sure. there are run uh, tons of run times. Um, I actually, there's a great awesome list. You can search for awesome Wasm run times and there's a fantastic list of like 50 or 60 run times because it's a specification, right? Um, but in addition, there's uh, various approaches have been have enabled it to be plugged into Kubernetes because you can run a runtime, some of them very small, inside a container and then run that whole thing in Kubernetes. So you can schedule that. That's sort of the easy way. And then there's actually uh, the CNCF project Crustlet, which uh, came originally out of uh, my team. That's such a cute. Um, name. Did you name that? Who named that? Right. No, I am. I don't even want to name names because they'll probably fight over who really? actually chose that name. Um, in fact, it's a Rust virtual kubelet that uh, has a provider model. So oh. you plug in the runtime you want, and then attach the the crust the kubelet to your cluster. And so that'll work anywhere. Uh, you know, it'll run, run on your little Raspberry Pi with with K3Ds. It'll do micro Kates or kind of whatever you you know happen to want. Um, so that's another way. But there are also container D shim uh, efforts as well. So there's lots of interoperability at the kubelet level. But there's embedded stuff too, like Envoy network filters and uh, Cube Warden, which also uses uh, WebAssembly for its you know kind of internal embedded um, protection mechanism for arbitrary third-party code, like network filters and stuff. So there are lots of ways it can integrate with Kubernetes, um, quite aside from the non-Kubernetes environments. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, so I, I, I think Crustlet's an amazing thing because, um, you know, you, could just, you can designate a node within a Kubernetes cluster as being able to schedule WebAssembly workloads um, in exactly the same way that it that any the other nodes would schedule um container container workloads and that's that's a, a great concept um for our the proof of concept that i was talking about um earlier we we went that route to start with the only downside i guess is that you have to be able to replace some of your nodes with crosslet nodes um rather than kubelet nodes and that and which is fine if you can do that um we chose to run um a web assembly runtime called wasm cloud inside docker containers on kubernetes um and then the each so each pod would be a wasm cloud host and they connect via nats um and form a like a self-healing lattice um and so that's like an, a platform on top of a platform i mean everyone's <laughs> kubernetes effectively was intended to be a, a platform for building platforms, right? Um, and so, you know, it makes perfect sense to build um, effectively a higher level of abstraction on top using WebAssembly. Um, and, I, and I think that's, we'll, we'll see a lot of that in the future. Cool. Yeah, and I, I noticed in the chat that uh, somebody's asking about using SecComp yep. to further clamp down syscalls, for example. And the answer is it's just a runtime. You can use exactly the, the tools that you should expect to use. Um, and with Web, WebAssembly specifically, there's also a emerging specification called the system interface and various other amendments to the spec that um, allow you to uh, declare precisely and only what types and, and calls go across the boundary, which means you can completely control down to the call exactly what happens from the host. So that also allows you to do even uh, as many things as SecComp does, but at a, diff at a different level. Uh, yeah, heads up to everybody else watching on Twitch. You you can absolutely ask questions in the Twitch chat. We can all see it uh, from, from Restream. So go ahead and ask away and I'll pop them up on stream as long as we have time. We've got another about eight minutes 
left. So if you think you've got questions, get them in now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let me pull up the schedule for Wasm Day, um, just so I can get another shill in for the co-located event. Uh, thanks for being so responsive to chat. No problem. I love Twitch chat. Chat's great. Uh, I see it looks like more than one thing that's like uh, edge or like IOT focused. Is that a super common use case for WebAssembly? The, w the way I learned for context, the way I learned Kubernetes in the first place was K3S. Uh, I had never touched Kubernetes before I was trying to get K3S to run on a Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. three years super ago common. before it yeah. was like, uh, super robust. So I, I, that is the wrong way to learn Kubernetes, people. Like, that's 100% <laughs> the wrong way to learn Kubernetes. Um, it was way more difficult than it needed to be. It was very fun, but it's the wrong way to learn Kubernetes. So um, is, is WebAssembly uh, any different trying to run it on the edge? Or is it, like, functionally the same process regardless of the hardware you're putting it on? Exactly the same. And I think that's that's the... Fuck killer. yeah. That's the killer feature. There's I've got one, Raspberry Pis all over the place here <laughs> running, running WebAssembly um, nodes and and a former cluster of Raspberry Pis all just sitting there. And it's, I mean, it's astonishing. Well, it in, and it goes a little bit more than that too. Uh, we'll show, you know, at KubeCon, you know, one of the demos I'll be doing is showing WebAssembly running. Uh, on AKS, so that's this big hyperscale service, right? Like Azure, Amazon, or like mm -hmm. Google, or anything like that. I'm going to run the same application on my Pine Phone, my Linux Pine Phone. Oh, that's on, that's okay. on Manjaro, that's cool. and that is the kind of portability that containers also bring, but with a little bit smaller spread. And Web Assemblies, because they're smaller and go at it a different way, can just go all kinds of crazy places. That's Okay. Uh, will you will you like DM me the the time of that? Because I'll go check it out. I, I mean, sure. I get there Monday, so just DM me and I'll I'll go. Okay. Um, we've got another question from the chat. Uh, do any of them deploy to secure enclaves? It would be amazing to have Kubernetes scheduled Wasm to an enclave. Yes, you can do that. All right, I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Later. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, the, I'll say yes to the tough question and then mo move. Um, no, the answer is yes. And the reason is there's nothing special about enclaves. This is just an API. Yeah. Um, and you can do that a couple of ways. One of the ways you may wish to look into, there was there is a project that was in the Confidential Computing Consortium, from mainly from Red Hat, called Enclave, which uh, actually does or it, the direction is to go and do that with workloads in WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, the way that Stu was talking about his work with the banks of actually putting Wasm Cloud inside a container and then just scheduling it normally like a con container, right? You can actually take the whole WebAssembly and execute it inside a, 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 tr a TE, a trusted execution environment. So those things can be done. And they have been demonstrated. It's doable. There isn't a uniform system or a project other than uh, one or two uh, that are sort of going that direction. So look at those things and and see how cool it is, and jump in and help out. Brad, it's crazy, isn't it? Because it, because it can go anywhere, it will go anywhere. I mean, it's going yeah. to go. <laughs> it's going to go everywhere. I mean, web browser tabs, um, Raspberry Pis. No, yeah, I, I mean, the interesting thing is called WebAssembly because if you've heard of it, it may have been in the context of you can run fast, complex C code in a browser kind of thing, right? Because that's where it was born. But it actually has general properties and you can just run it anywhere. Uh, so, there is a co comment about enclaves have weird limitations. Uh, the answer, uh, like no fork. Um, right now, there's no threading like Node originally. And so no fork is no problem. So not to be like aggressively online and also show my age a little bit, but does this, I know that you, I know you're older than me, Ralph, but, but uh, I'm, I'm of a generation where a question is frequently, but can it run doom? So 
does this make it easier to run Doom in places where Doom otherwise wouldn't? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Not only does it run Doom, but Windows 95 runs in the browser. You can just run that anywhere. Oh, easy. Thank you, then. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I no, have I mean, Doom running on my calculator. Uh, speaking so. from Microsoft's point of view, no one <laughs> wants to run Windows 95. <laughs> no, but no. Doom, yes. But the last time I touched Windows 95 was actually not that long ago. Uh, it was like... That's stunning. It was like 2000. I mean, I, okay, I say not that long ago, but you know how time gets weird as you age? It was 2009. Uh, but the video store I worked at was still running Windows 95 on their rental computer, and I had to upgrade it. It was a nightmare. Anyway. All uh, right. We have one Wasm more Doom. question. Search Wasm Doom <laughs> on your favorite search engine, which might be Google. And guess what you'll come up with about... 52 different versions of it. Incredible. Good. Yeah. I mean, that's all I need to know to understand whether or not a product is actually viable yeah. and useful for me. It, it, strangely enough, uh, some of the WebAssembly functionality that you wouldn't think of right out of the... Like, here's Stuart, and we're talking in the context of uh, Kubernetes and all this kind of stuff. But there are amazing flexible uses uh, that are out there. So Microsoft Flight Simulator, strangely enough, um, now uses as their mod soundbox. So you're going to do a mod, you're going to make a this third party code, and they don't want it, you to bring down the whole system. That would have been a DLL in the standard Microsoft world, you know. Uh, now they just take a WebAssembly. You compile a WebAssembly, and then they, they run that. So that's the way they do mods now. Um, another example is, um, and these are all Microsoft examples because I'm from Microsoft and I discovered sure. them spelunking yeah. around. Excel that weird thing that everybody knows how to use um, has some very complex C code from the client version from 1985. And they, instead of trying to port that to the online version, and this has to do with building Lambda functions inside cells, which is relatively complex work, uh, they just compiled the C code from 1985 into a web assembly and dropped it in the web. Okay, that and kind of slaps. It's amazing. And now, okay. that, that, ignore the Excel part or the flight simulator part. That's how flexible it is. Okay, yeah. cool, rad. Uh, now that the use cases for it can get goofy, I'm considerably more interested in... <laughs> I love dumb, goofy shit, so this is... Uh... is goofy, but I do want to make one thing clear. These are early days. So, Stu, how was the dev experience? Did Wasm Cloud help you out a little bit, or did you try different things first before you got there? Well, I mean, for, I, I, I think it's actually surprisingly good for, the, for how young the technology is. So um, I, I love Rust. It's one, you know, an amazing programming language, and the tool chain for that is exceptionally good. And as smooth as you like for WebAssembly. And you know, this is becoming, uh, setting a new standard really for the, the quality of the developer experience in terms of targeting WebAssembly as a compile target. Um, Zig, Grain, Rust, you know, all of these new languages have an exceptionally good developer experience in that space. So um, compiling your application or your program to run um, in a WebAssembly runtime is is fairly straightforward, I think. I mean, I think Stu's lying. Ooh. It's hard. <laughs> I think Stu found a good, happy path for himself. Yeah, I, well, I I definitely did find the happy path deliberately. Y'all should fight about it. Sort that out. <laughs> let's schedule another half hour, can we? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, we can keep going if nobody has a hard stop for a little bit. But we are we are technically at time and should start wrapping up. There is another show coming on uh, after that needs to uh, queue up. So we can't keep going for too much longer. Well, I'll just say this. Uh, uh, Stu, I'm thrilled that you found a relatively good experience in the languages that you were interested in. There are some problems I think everybody should know so they don't get too excited too fast and then run into a brick wall. Yeah. Like the container ecosystem, there are a lot of languages that don't yet support exactly what you want. And there are limitations to the specifications. Like I, There's no threading yet. Uh, or rather, there's limited versions of threading. And things like GC and stuff like this don't exist yet. There are proposals. They'll come. 
But so if you're expecting interpreted languages inside the module, well, they don't have the APIs to do the interpretation, the memory management, things like this. So those will be a little harder to get running yet. Um, and some of the dev tools around that are going to be a little bit bumpy depending on your language. Rust is great. Um, you know, if you're doing JavaScript or one of the JavaScript engines, right, like this fantastic and so forth. Um, Python has, <laughs> works in Wasm, but guess what you got to do? You got to drop all of Python inside Wasm, which is doable. But doable, again, but a little hairy. Not well, it's but it's necessarily hairy. something that Stu... Uh, Stu's going to want a big check to help you do that. For example, it's not a, <laughs> it's not an easy thing. So just to be aware that there are cool. some easier paths, which is fantastic, and there are other paths that still need to be still need to be built. But everybody's help is a, is is welcome. It's all upstream. This is all open source work, which is fantastic, and I'm thrilled to be at uh, KubeCon and and talk more about it. It's great actually that it, that it's it's becoming like the almost like the first thing that modern languages are doing is making sure they can target WebAssembly. There's, there's the, fu the future is there and, <laughs> um, you know, new languages need to be there, which is great. Well, um, do you all have any parting words before we, before we wrap up and close it out so the next show can come on? Well, I did, see, I did see a question about performance and, you know, it <laughs> is near native, which I think is, um, it's incredibly important. Um, it's because it's a binary format. It's just you know it's executing at native speed, um, and the startup time fifty microseconds mentioned there. Like there's a future there for um, serverless. You know, with, to completely banish the yeah. cold startup that we see today with um, with the serverless platform. So you know, I think it's it, it's got a lot of potential. We haven't even seen the beginning of it yet. Yeah, I think that's true. And and there are so many places to not only start and contribute, um, you can look at the, the awesome list, choose a language, choose a runtime that you're interested in, you have skills in already, so you don't have to do that learning curve. Um, there's a couple of uh, scaffolding uh, tools. Uh, we built a kind of a yeoman scaffolding thing called Yo Wasm. So you can, if you want to just scaffold out and have a look at how it might work and one or a couple of your languages, that's something you can do. They're online tools. The Bytecode Alliance has a, a, a good set of tools that you can dig into if you want to collaborate on um, some upstream engines. But almost all of the engines like Wasm Cloud, Wasmer, uh, Wasm Edge from Second State, there's a whole bunch of them that are small companies and all of their work is um, open source as well. So right. all places are great places to start, um, jump in. Uh, because this is a time where everything you do is in a tremendous addition to everybody else's stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of fun as well. And you can run Doom on it, I guess. And you can <laughs> run Doom on it. We'll send the best. I'll send the best link to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, you have been a pleasure. You've both been uh, informative and entertaining, which is uh, always always nice. You make it you make it easy. You make it very easy to, to interview you. And uh, Twitch chat, thank you for being here, especially the people that had questions and the people were helping answer questions a bit in the Twitch chat. Uh, stay tuned. We do have another show coming up uh, next. Um, I believe it will be Pop interviewing Priyanka, who is the GM. She is the GM, right? She's a GM of the CNCF. So um, Pop is going to interview the big kahuna. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be interesting too. Um, register for Wasm Day. Come to KubeCon virtual or in person. Get a vaccine. Um, come say hi to me at KubeCon. I'll be there. Ralph will be there. So come come wave at us. I'm going to be in London, unfortunately. But I'm oh, yeah, but well, well, Kat and I will get together and we will mock you. Just we will mock you. Know, yeah, you know, virtually. Yeah, exactly. Mercilessly. Yeah. Hey, I will listen, actually... Kat, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been great. Of course. See y'all later. Bye, Twitch. Bye, Bye take care.